Um, so my name is Jake. I'm the product manager for the Google OCR team. Um, Google OCR uh, is the team, the research team that sits behind Google's Cloud Vision API offering. Um, the Cloud Vision API is a generic OCR API that supports 232 languages across 31 scripts. Um, we have handwriting support for a few languages, uh, a few scripts rather, Latin, Japanese, and Korean. Um, we say we have a unified model recognizing both. Uh, that's a little bit hand wavy. We have that internally. It hasn't quite launched on the, the API yet, um, but it will be launching shortly. Um, I kind of want to stress, you're going to hear a lot of echoes of Gunter's talk uh, in, in my discussion here. Um, I want to stress that this is a generic OCR offering. The goal here is that any image with text on it, we ought to be able to extract the text from it. Um, that's not true, right? Uh, it turns out that, as Gunter said, there's a lot of sort of domain-specific things that happen. That mean the more training data you have that looks like the, the eval data or the, the actual production data, the better off you're going to be. Um, and so here's sort of an example of this is, uh, this is what we would call data that looks like other data, right? This is the same handwriting, my handwriting. Um, it is the same background. Uh, it's the same pen. It's the same uh, image resolution uh, in, in my camera screenshot. Like these are very similar domains, but it's actually hard to define what a domain is. And it's hard to define what two things look enough like each other um, that they would, they're sort of good replacements in, in training data. Um, some dimensions that definitely matter are listed out here. Uh, there's probably a lot more that matter that either are not easily describable in one or two words for humans, um, or that are maybe easily describable but are, are not things that came to the top of my mind. So the point here is that uh, getting training data that matches your domain is actually a, a non-trivial problem, particularly if you don't sort of already have a, a well-defined uh, domain up front. Here's a few examples um, that we've found over the last couple of years. Um, some of these we've gotten better at because we've explicitly gone out and collected data for, but all of these you can see how a, a general OCR model that was trained to detect text from any image might get these wrong, right? So faxes are, are generally low resolution. They have weird artifacts that don't show up elsewhere. These vertical lines are very confusing to our OCR system. Um, and we, we see we have quite poor, poor performance on text. Um, historical documents that either have fonts we haven't seen before or have some bleed through from the other side um, have historically been quite difficult. Um, some of the things similar to uh, what Gunter was showing of, of historical documents with stylistic handwriting, what we would consider today to be stylistic handwriting. Um, some fonts that are just weird, right? This, this font at the bottom that shows up on movie posters um, is just very, very tall. <laughs> the ratio of height to width of the, the characters is just very extreme. And if your OCR model hasn't seen that, your OCR model is not going to do well. Um, somewhat ironically, these seven segment displays that are intended to be extremely easy to read, if you haven't trained your OCR model and then it uh, turns out your OCR model does not think that it looks like a four, um, it thinks it looks like something else. Um, so all of this to say there are lots of domains for which, you know, until you try them and recognize that you don't perform well, you don't know that you don't perform well. And uh, there's this question of how many domains are there out there like this that we would have to solve if we were to have a truly general generic OCR system. So the question of how to fix high error rates uh, is a somewhat um, uh, introspective comic. Uh, it, the answer is add more data, right? The answer is if you want to get better at a particular domain, there's some upper bound on how well you can do in that domain for the current set of technologies that exist. You know, neural networks are not perfect, um, but they're pretty good. And in general, the answer is always go get more data and train your model on more data. <clears throat> So here's a couple of, of examples um, that we have found. Uh, this is from a couple years ago, um, but this is a bunch of different historical document data sets. In gray, you can see the performance of our baseline system um, where lower is better, this is error rate. Um, in the light purple in the middle, you can see if we include the training data from just that historical data set, um, these data sets are all sort of separated out into to training and test. <clears throat> so if we just fine tune on that particular data set, we get a lot better. And then if we fine tune on all of the data, uh, which means the training sets from all of these different historical data uh, sets, we get even better in almost all cases. <clears throat> what this means is there's some amount of alignment between the domain of these uh, other historical data sets um, with each other, right? There's some sort of overlap here and including training data from one historical data set turns out to make you better at other historical data sets. Um, that is a fact about the domain, right? The data sets themselves. That's, that doesn't necessarily have to be true in this particular set of historical documents that was true. All of this to say, these are pretty sort of astoundingly large gains. 
right? Um, depending on how stylized the, the documents are and how out of domain they are from your normal training data, maybe that's not so surprising. Um, but I was certainly surprised when I saw these numbers that you're sort of able to double effective performance on a, a lot of, of data sets just by including a relatively small amount of training data. Here's another example. Um, <clears throat> so Google Cloud in particular cares about enterprise customers. And I, I apologize for some of this text here. This was a screenshot from an internal tool. Um, but cloud in particular cares about enterprise customers um, because cloud is a business and they try to make money and enterprise customers are the ones that tend to have lots of money. Um, filling out of forms is a very common thing that happens in, in enterprise um, and trying to parse these forms is common. Um, forms are hard for a number of reasons. Uh, people tend to not write very neatly on forms. Uh, they tend to be not sort of as, as high resolution as you'd like. They tend to have weird artifacts like underlines um, where things are, are written on top of a baseline which again, if your OCR system hasn't seen that before, you're not gonna do well at it. Um, so here's uh, an example of, on the left, this is what our, our system did initially, where we got this very wrong. Um, on the right, we went through and we did a data collection effort where we collected 10,000 images of documents that were filled out by raters um, by hand. And uh, I forget the number of raters, but it was in the dozens to hundreds of people doing handwriting um, on these forms. <clears throat> And we retrained and we fine-tuned our model on top of this and we got significantly better results, sort of exactly as you would expect in, in domains for which we had not seen that domain, right? So for someone just writing a generic thing on a page, we didn't get very much better. Um, for someone who's writing things on top of an underline, top of a baseline, or for someone who's writing individual characters within boxes, right? If you have a social security number or something where there's nine individual boxes and you're supposed to write a character in each of them, that's quite difficult for an OCR system that's never seen it. But if you retrain on that data, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and the lesson here is if your OCR model performs badly, you add more data in the domain that you care about. Um, handwriting is sort of an interesting case. Uh, and, and again, echoing some of Gunter's points, um, everyone's handwriting is different, but there are commonalities across different regions, people, timeframes. Um, it's hard to describe what the important sets of, of domains are, right? What the, what the dimensions along which people's handwriting vary. Um, Here's a chart of, of sort of what we saw for generic handwriting internally. Uh, we have a bunch of data synthesis stuff that, that tries to generate a, a reasonable model to start off with. And then we start adding real training lines. So this is sort of real captured in the wild handwriting from people. Um, and you can see it's certainly a downward trend, right? But it's definitely this exponential downward trend where, uh, as, as Gunter said, as you double the data, you get some performance gain. Um, we, we certainly see something similar to that here. Um, the conclusion here is, is that yes, more data will help on handwriting, um, probably indefinitely, right? Like you're probably gonna asymptotically approach something, but you'll always keep getting better as you add more data, certainly up to the reasonable limits of, of data adding today. Um, but handwriting is sort of genuinely harder than block printed text in some important way. Um, my sort of personal hobby horse is that I think new language model approaches might be a path towards better handwriting recognition going forward, um, because I think that's a thing that's probably the, the area of lowest hanging fruit, at least in the Google system today. I want to talk for a second about cloud. Um, so cloud is the mechanism by which Google OCR exposes itself to the world, right? If, if you want to get access to Google's OCR, the way to do it is to call the Google Cloud Vision API. Um, cloud really cares about enterprise use cases. Uh, like I said before, they're a business, they operate that way. So they're trying really hard and putting in a lot of effort and collecting a lot of data to get really good at tax forms and mortgages and invoices and all kinds of sort of enterprise focused things. Um, it's not clear to me that that's gonna end up benefiting libraries and, and archives and museums because the pricing for that is probably gonna be sort of uh, higher than, <laughs> than you'd like to pay. And also because you mostly don't care about invoices, mortgages and tax forms. You mostly care about historical documents. Um, cloud will continue to improve as the OCR team, as the research team continues to improve. And so documents, so will cloud uh, because cloud sort of takes our models and exposes them directly, but they're not going to put any specific work to try and get better at historical documents. And this is my last slide. So the, the holy grail here um, would be customization, right? And, and again, as, as Gunter talked about, um, so there's really two reasons we can't be good at every domain. Collecting data is expensive and fine tuning models is hard. Um, the data cost can, in principle, be borne by the caller, right? If you care enough about a particular thing, you can go collect data yourself. The engineering cost for us is borne by Google. We want to get to a world where, where that engineering cost goes to zero, right? Where it becomes trivially easy to retrain models. Um, 
and we're not there yet, but we hope to get there. Uh, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm talking about something that's quite similar to what Transcribus has, has already done. Um, possible solutions here, uh, either we open source stuff and then uh, libraries, archives, and museums develop really strong ML expertise. Um, option two is we open source stuff and we just have really good training strips. And I, this, I would call this the transcribus option, uh, where there's sort of this UI and you don't actually need to be a technical expert in order to, to update your models. Um, and then third is we have some sort of online AutoML-like solution where you don't actually even have to do your own ground truth, right? You just send us, here's 100 pages, please annotate them and retrain your model for me. Um, and it just sort of magically happens. That's the direction we want to go. Uh, we're not there yet. I don't want to represent like Google is particularly close to being there, but our hope is that we will get there at some point. Um, and that's it for me. Jake, thanks so much. One of the things we've talked about, and you heard it at the beginning of this, was that libraries, archives, and museums have a lot of original source data. We've talked about things like competitions, maybe similar to what the British Library, uh, I think, has run it, that Tom spoke to. Um, is there a way that as a community, we might effectively pool our data to uh, create training data and better models that could then be shared across at least the library archives and museum sector? I can say from Google's perspective, the, the research team is in a little bit of a weird place where they are sort of traditional academics um, and, and want to share things and want to, uh, to write papers and open source stuff. Um, in practice, because OCR is a, a sort of competitive differentiator for Google Cloud, um, the path towards open sourcing and releasing is quite difficult. So I, I wouldn't count on sort of Google open sourcing, uh, certainly not the, the best internal models we have anytime soon. That said, if there was a giant pool of data that was you know, historical documents and uh, people care about Google OCR getting better at historical documents, certainly I think we'd, we would want to use that and, and improve our models there. So. Uh, maybe less on the, the sharing side, but uh, certainly we would, we would want uh, as, as much open data as possible. And, and I think we're more likely to open source data than we are to open source models. Um, we have some, some internal projects right now where we're trying to push that forward.